All right, so this lesson is entitled Shi Huangdi and the Qin Dynasty. And this is part two of a four-part series on classical China. All right, so when we finished up the last lesson, we were looking at Confucius. And remember, Confucius comes out of this warring states period, this great power vacuum in China, um, you know, this military instability and all this fighting. And out of that period comes a military strongman, right? Now, military strongmen show up throughout human history. This is not unique or special in Chinese history. Um, and, and there's something about the military strongman. So I want you to have this concept, and we're going to look at it in Chinese history, but it's a concept you'll hear me talk about in upcoming lessons and later on in the year and next year and things like that. So you know, pay attention to this concept of the military strongman. Because right? like I said, it, it really related to this idea of the power vacuum and failed feudal states like the Zhou dynasty. They're often either united or reunited by a military strongman. And these military strongmen, they're warriors. Uh, the military strongman is ruthless. He's bloodthirsty. He may even be sociopathic, right? Literally crazy um, in a violent way, willing to murder thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. But the military strongman brings peace and stability and an end to violence, kind of by centralizing and controlling the application of violence because he's the only one in the civilization who does the violence or his men who do it for him. He kind of has this monopoly on violence, um, but it has this weird effect of bringing peace, right? And remember one of our driving questions for this unit has to do with uniting people through violence, um, you know, from violence. And, you know, we don't like violence, we hate violence, um, but we have to recognize that it's part of the human experience and a part of civilizations, right? And so we're going to look now at the chin, right? And first of all, Qin was a state. This was one of the smaller warring, warring states in China during the war, warring states period. And the Qin rise, um, they gained power through experimenting with iron and bronze farm tools and weapons, right? They, this use of metals. You know, so much of this has to do just with science and technology and chemistry, right? They begin to experiment with iron and bronze and they can make better tools and weapons. Right? And so because they're able to attack and defend more effectively and because they're able to farm and grow more food, they begin to have more wealth. Right? And that wealth begins to attract more of these she bureaucrats, these educated, learned men who can help run the government and they help grow the power of Qin. Right? Also because they have these advanced weapons, they adopt the crossbow and what we call massed cavalry warfare. Remember, cavalry is the use of horses. I mean, literally masses of horses running in formation and attacking. We may not think that's very special now, but you can imagine you're a Chinese peasant foot soldier, you know, with a, a spear or a regular old bow and arrow, and all of a sudden you've got 100 horses running at you at 30 or 40 miles an hour. That's terrifying. Right? And also the Qin believed in having free peasants because they were more productive. They could make more money rather than taxing them too much or turning them into slaves. The Qin kind of let people be free and that ended up making them richer. Um, you know, one of the things that united the Qin was this idea of legalism. And this was a branch of Confucianism. Right? And it emphasized the duty of the subject to the ruler. Remember, we have those five relations in Confucianism. The legalists kind of, well, I mean, they believed in the other four, but I mean, it's really all about, you know, the duty of the subject to the ruler. Not so much the ruler to the subject. It's not the emperor has to, or the king has to do stuff for his people, but the people have to do stuff for the king. They believe that people exist to serve the state. And they do that by t paying taxes, fighting, and obeying the ruler. Um, the legalists were, I mean, this, car this is kind of a funny cartoon about a man named Han, Han Faijie who, you know, supported and defined legalism 
you know, kind of a harsh cartoon, but I mean, the legalists were tough. Right? And one person who followed the way of legalism was a man named Qin Shi Huang Di. Now, usually in the West, we refer to him as Shi Huang Di. Remember, with Chinese names, Qin is actually the family name, right? In the same way that my family name is Brooke. And then Shi Huang Di was his personal name in the same way my personal name is Brooke, right? So. You know, I would be Brayman Brook if this was a Chinese name. Um, you know, so we're going to see refer to him as Shi Huang Di. You'll notice sometimes the spelling is a little different. Remember, Chinese doesn't use the same letters as English, so when it gets translated, some translators will spell the name differently. So keep an eye on that when you're dealing with Chinese names throughout this course. Is you know, if I spell it a certain way in a lecture, and then you see it in writing. Um, that spelling, that's why, right? So Shi Huang Di was a Qin warrior. His nickname was the Tiger of Qin, right? So dealing with Eastern Asia, if you're a tiger, that's some serious business right there. And like I said, he was a legalist, uh, really believed that everybody was supposed to obey him. Uh, in fact, there's a quote from the Stearns textbook, right? Because of complaints from his officials, he once had hundreds of Xi officials buried alive. I mean, this guy did not play, right? But under Qi Huangdi, the Qin conquered all of the warring states in united China. There it is, right? That kind of connection between violence and unity, um, which is, you know... I'm not trying to answer the driving question. You don't have to agree, um, but you know, it's evidence that you know violence can bring peace and unity. Um, in fact, China is named for the Qin Dynasty, which would not exist without Shi Huangdi's military genius and bloodthirstiness. Right. So there's that driving question again. Right. Can large groups of people um, be united without violence? Well, a guy like Shi Huangdi shows that they. Can, you know that violence is necessary. Uh, some more, you know, some of the achievements that took place in the Qin Dynasty. By the way, remember to do your spice, guys. Remember to do your spice. Right <clears throat> uh, under the Qin, uh, you know, Qi Huangdi replaced petty kings with bureaucrats. He brought the feudal system back in order, which means that there was an emperor once again. Um, he standardized writing, he standardized coinage, and he standardized weights and measures of distance, which this may not seem like a big deal to you, but could you imagine if Oregon and Washington and Idaho and Nevada and California all had different units of money? So when you traveled to Oregon, you had to get your Washington dollars transferred into Oregonian pounds, and then when you went down to California, you had to get your Oregonian pounds transferred into Californian pesos or something like that. It would be awful. I mean, it would really slow down business and slow down how things worked, right? And if you went from Montana to Minnesota and, and words were spelled differently because they just had different writing, it would be very difficult for us to have a United States, right? So these things are really a big deal. And before these early classical empires, there weren't these things. And so it it was hard to hang together big civilizations like this. So this was really a big deal. Um, they also developed a system of walls that would later be joined to form the Great Wall of China. Uh, Shi Huangdi did not cause this directly. This happened during the Han Dynasty, which we're going to study next. But they started building the walls that would later be linked together. Also spent a lot of work on roads and canals. Remember, a canal is like a man-made ditch it's kind of a man-made river, which, you know, canals are great for moving stuff around. You don't even have to have horses or, or roads or things like that. You just put stuff on a barge and move it up and down the canals. And those canals are still used in China today, right? Um, also, he's very famous for his tomb, right? This is the tomb of Shi Huangdi. You see it a lot in anything about China. It's kind of like the Great Wall. Um, and this goes back to that idea of monumental architecture as an act of the ruler's pride, right? I've got the biggest tomb around, and so I'm the biggest baller around, right? But eventually the Qin started to decline, 
right? Because just like violence can bring people together, it can also drive them apart. And the military strongman is a very important thing in world history. But what happens if this guy is just flat out crazy? And Shi Huangdi was crazy, like Adolf Hitler crazy, right? Um, and he made a lot of his people very angry. Um, you know, because if you're going to build all this big fancy stuff, you need lots of tax money, which makes your subjects very a angry, right? Nobody wants to pay 60 or 80 percent in taxes. Um, he also supported book burnings and very heavy censorship of anything that disagreed with him and his government. And like I said, the guy's crazy. I mean, we don't know how he died, but he might have died. He might have been poisoned by his search for a potion for eternal life that was provided by his Taoist priest advisors, right? Possibly even mercury poisoning, right? And if you're interested in medicine or biology or chemistry, the guy might have had mercury poisoning, which is an awful way to die. But again, he was crazy. He wanted to live forever and rule the world and... Um, you know, and this really brought about the end of his dynasty. When you have one man who controls everything, if he falls apart, everything falls apart, which is part of why I like democracy. All right, so I got some final questions to leave you with here, right? How are we to interpret a man like Shi Huang Di? Is he a hero or a villain? Is he the father of his country or is he just a pirate in fancy robes? Right? And do his contributions to China outweigh his brutality? Right? It's like, well, you know, he killed a million people, but he brought us standardized coinage and temples and roads and made us rich. I mean, how do we view a guy like this? Um, right? And so is that brutality worth more or less than an end to the anarchy and the violence in the warring states period? Right? In the warring states period, you've got people dying all over the place. Under Shi Huangdi, everybody's just dying because of the emperor. Well, and because they're getting old and starving too. Right? So what are the positives and, and negatives of any military strongman? These are hard questions to ask. Right? A guy like Saddam Hussein of Iraq was a military strongman. And he murdered a lot of people. But you look at the violence and chaos in Iraq now, a lot of people said, you know, we would have been better off leaving, leaving a crazy murderer like Saddam Hussein in power than getting all the crazy murders that we have in the streets right now. Hard question to answer. I'll let you think about it for the next 50 years. And so that's it. This is part two of our series on, on classical China. Thanks for watching.